So, good morning, guten Morgen, Mr. Kulu. Welcome to another lecture within our course, Machine Learning Basic Principles. Today will be the last lecture on uh, content. So we'll talk about uh, Gaussian mixture models and feature learning, which are unsupervised methods. But before I start to dive into these methods, I quickly want to point you to this new menu here. I just found out in my course is all well, where you can find information about a lot of offers for supporting you in succeeding in your studies regarding study skills, how to plan your studies, uh, how to do time management, also uh, a learning psychologist offers and offers regarding well-being. And um, I'm really proud of Aalto University, which takes your well-being uh, quite seriously. And just to be sure, making use of these services uh, is not a sign of weakness, but uh, rather not making use of these super helpful services is a sign of stupidity. So I really want to recommend you having a look at all the offers there are, and there are a lot of offers provided by Alto supporting you to succeed in your studies. For example, in succeeding in machine learning basic principles. So we will now look at to some machine learning methods, which are called unsupervised machine learning methods. And we had in the last lecture started to discuss clustering methods. So in clustering methods, we, we try to make sense of a data set. So let's assume we have a bunch of, of snapshots, webcam snapshots, which are characterized by two features, x1 and x2. And we want to make some sense out of it for the sake of easier processing or then a more convenient representation of the data. And we, we heard about clustering methods. So there are two main flavors of clustering methods. What are the two main flavors of clustering we have looked at? Yes? K-means clustering is an example of a hard clustering method. So we, uh, we associate each data point. So this, for example, here is one data point. Might be one feature vector characterized by a feature vector, which has two features, x1 and x2. And we try to organize it or group it into clusters. And there are two principal types of clustering algorithms. One algorithm, uh, type of algorithm is called hard clustering, where we have uh, a clustering such that each data point belongs to one and exactly one cluster. And k-means does that for us. Another approach, which I started to discuss in the last lecture, is soft clustering. And in soft clustering, we allow the clusters to overlap. overlap. So we have here a cluster, might be cluster 1, and another cluster overlapping cluster 2. And in soft clustering, we try to find, or we try to, uh, to associate to each data point, for example, this here, degrees of belonging. So what is the degree of belonging of this data point to cluster 1? We denote this by yi1. And what is the degree of belonging to cluster 2? yi2. And these degrees of belonging for the sake of of uh, notation, we, we constrain to be within the interval 0 to 1. So 1 means belongs fully to one cluster. 0 means belongs not at all to a cluster. But how, how do we come up with a scheme or an algorithm to map each data point to two such numbers, to the soft cluster assignments? How, how to come up with a principled approach to map data points to soft cluster assignments. And I tried hard 
within this lecture to avoid any probabilistic models. So you can explain pretty much everything about machine learning validation, how to fit, how to do a linear regression without any probability theory. However, I don't know any other way to formulate soft clustering or to come up with soft clustering algorithms except then using a probabilistic model for the data. So now I cannot avoid it, I'm sorry, we now have to bring in some probability theory. And this goes as follows, we, we represent a cluster by a distribution. Represent, for example, cluster one by a probability distribution. And in particular, we represent a cluster. So what, what probability distributions are you aware of? Have you ever encountered something like a probability distribution in your life? A Gaussian, Poisson, yeah. So you, these are just modeling concepts. This is a concept like a, a hypothesis space, an abstract concept. You don't see Gaussian random variables in practice. You just see numbers, measurements, bits, bytes, text in practice. However, it turns out to be useful to model what you see, the data, as realizations of random variables, and random variables have some probability distribution. And here we use probability distribution models. So I have heard already one possible choice for probability distribution of a feature vector, two-dimensional feature vector, could be a, a Gaussian distribution. And we denote the Gaussian distribution like this, calligraphic N, then uh, the random variable, the generic symbol for the random variable. So this here means a random variable a random vector, in our case, two-dimensional random vector. And a Gaussian distribution has parameters. What are the parameters of a Gaussian distribution? Yes? A mean vector and a covariance matrix. Or oh, let's use yeah, the symbols. Uh, it's always a difficult question how, which letters to use. Let's say M for mean and C for covariance matrix. So the mean of this random vector can be represented here, for example, using this dot. So this might be the mean of the first cluster or the probability distribution which we use to represent cluster one. And the covariance matrix, so this here has a, a sub superscript a one because this is, we use one distribution for each cluster, so this distribution for cluster one. And we can also express the spread, the shape of the cluster using the covariance matrix. So the covariance matrix of cluster one or of the distribution that represents cluster one uh, somehow represents the shape of cluster one. And we do the same, another probability distribution for cluster two, the mean of cluster two and the covariance of cluster two. So we, here we might have the mean and here we encode the shape of cluster two by a covariance matrix cluster, uh, co covariance matrix C2. Okay, so that's just a model. We, came up, we come up with a model that tries to explain the data that we see as realizations or draws from a probability distribution which is a Gaussian or multivariate normal distribution of a Gaussian random vector to be precise. Okay, so far so good. So do we know, do we know these parameters here? Typically, when you, you had in your assignment the, the task to implement a soft clustering algorithm. So did, you, did we provide you the cluster means and the cluster covariance matrices? These are parameters of this probabilistic model. How did we get these parameters? Was it thrown to you by some higher instance? You, you had to estimate it. You had to iteratively estimate it. Okay? But let's now assume for the time being that we know the parameters. Somebody tells you, well, for example, by looking at the data, you see that the mean, it would be good here to use a Gaussian with mean vector here and the covariance matrix whose shape corresponds to this somewhat tilted uh, ellipse. Let's say we have it. Let's assume for the time being 
this mean vectors and the covariance matrices given. Somebody gave it to us. We have a vector with numbers, with entries, and covariance matrices, we know it. Okay, so what can we do now further? We, we represent a cluster by a probability distribution. And then a particular data point, a particular data point, xi, so the first, for example, the first feature vector that comes along into your data set is drawn, is a draw from one of these distributions, from such a Gaussian distribution with some mean vector, ci, and some covariance matrix, C, C, I. So this here, the C, I, is the cluster indicator, or cluster assignment of data point X, I. So this variable tells you from which cluster did we draw the ith data point. So C, I is an element of the set one, two. Class, either cluster one or cluster two. Do we know the cluster assignment? Do we know from which cluster this, for example, this data point has been drawn? Does somebody throw it to you? What are the cluster, the cluster assignments? Well, what is the goal of clustering? To find out the cluster assignments, exactly. So the goal of clustering is to find these cluster assignments. We don't know them, they are unknown. So this, these are unknown. However, we can always model anything as random variables, so we also model this as random variables. However, we mo these are random variables which are not seen. They are somewhere exist, they are random, but we don't measure them. We don't we don't observe the realizations of these random variables. All we observe is the realization of this random variable. So somehow we need to connect these unknown random variables, which we would like to know or like to estimate, with the observed random variables, which are the feature vectors. So how, how are these related? How are random variables related with each other? Well, we could ask, what is the probability that the cluster indicator takes on, for example, one. So what is the probability that the true underlying cluster would have been one based on the observed feature vector? Similar, we could ask ourselves, what is the probability that the cluster assignment is two based on the observed feature vector? And then we get some numbers for those, which tell us what would be the probability of, on average, how likely would have been the true underlying cluster index one, given the observed data. Does that make sense? So in pro once you have a probabilistic model, and you model every quantity as a random variable, some of the random variables you observe, like the feature vector, some of them you don't observe, like the cluster assignment, but which you're interested in, well, what you do, and the prob probabil probabilistic machine learning uh, relies on one approach, or one, one a quantity, which is this here. You condition on all the quantities you observe and compute the posterior probability, this is called the posterior probability, of what the value of the unknown quantity, which you would like to know, is given the observed data. This is the key idea underlying any probabilistic machine learning method. And you will hear, uh, I mean, it sounds super easy, but in practice, the difficulties are, how do you evalu evaluating this probability density function or probability distribution is highly non-trivial and difficult. And you hear in two courses, at least two courses I'm aware of, Bayesian data analysis and in uh, advanced probabilistic models, you hear different powerful methods to compute this uh, conditional probability distributions. But the idea is simple. 
you just evaluate the probability of what would have been the value of the unknown quantity given all the known quantities. Yeah, and actually it comes up pretty naturally how, how we define here or what the degree of belonging could be. Well, we define the degree of belonging simply, so the degree of, of the data point I belonging to cluster one is just the posterior probability of CI equal to one given the observed data point. The probability, uh, the degree of belonging to cluster two is the posterior probability of <clears throat> cluster index being equal to two given the observed data point. Does that make sense? Well, by the way, naturally, this quantity is between zero and one, which is what we would like to have. By construction, these two quantities, if you sum them up together, what do you get? One, yeah, if you sum up all the probabilities of elementary events, which together make up all possible events, so the cluster assignment can only be one or two, either one of two, and if you sum them up, then you get one. That's called the law of total probability. Okay, so let's define the degree of belonging like this, and how do we calculate it? Well, we need to, we need to find out what this posterior probability is. And it turns out that it's easier or what is more natural is to get the, the probability in the other direction. So the probability, the conditional probability of xi given that the class assignment is one. Because this means what would be the probability distribution if this data point is drawn from cluster one? Well, what is our modeling assumption? Cluster one is represented by this probability distribution. So we, we know it by construction of our model. So this is normal distribution with mean vector M1 and covariance vector C1, uh, C, C1, yeah, sorry. So, and what is the conditional probability distribution of CI equal to? The same thing, but the probability distribution for cluster two, which is a multivariate normal distribution with mean M2 and covariance matrix C2. So this is pretty straightforward. This follows basically follows from definition from the definition of our model, and this model is called a Gaussian mixture model. This is a Gaussian mixture model. Mixture model. Okay. So how can we use this? these two uh, expressions for the conditional probability of the data point given the cluster assignment to compute the conditional probability of the cluster assignment given the data point. What fundamental rule in Bayesian statistics helps you here? How to turn, this is called the a prior, uh, a, a priori distribution. How to get from this priority distribution to the posterior distribution. Which rule is used here or can be used? Bayes rule, exactly. We use Bayes rule which tells us that the probability that the cluster assignment is one given the observed data point xi is the conditional probability the other way around, xi given ci equal one times the prior probability that CI is one divided by the sum of all these probabilities for I equal one to two. No. Times the probability of XI. So this is Bayes rule. Base rule. Uh, this we know by construction. This is this here. What about this here? Do we know this probability? 
So the probability that the cluster, that the i data point is generated from cluster one. Do we know this probability? Do we know what is the proportion? How often does a data point come from cluster one and how often does it come from cluster two? Yes? Yeah, we don't know it, we don't know it. So this is some number, some unknown number, we call it cluster probability, PC, which is, or let's say P1, which is between zero and one, and there's a cluster probability for the other cluster, which is between zero and one. They have to sum to one, have to be within zero or one, or otherwise unknown. So P1 and P2 are also parameters of our model of the Gaussian mixture model. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we assume now also that we know this, so that we know P1 and P2. Well, then we can insert here, and we can evaluate base rule to get the degrees of belonging. So this is our, as we defined, our degree of belonging, Y1, Yi1, and similar we get Yi2. And these, as we define it, are just the posterior probabilities of cluster assignment being equal to one given the observed data point. Okay, so far so good, but we used a lot of, of knowledge that we don't have actually. We used all these parameters. So to recap, the, for this, we need to compute this, we need, we need the Gaussian mixture model parameters which are are the cluster probabilities, P1, P2, the mean vectors, M1, M2, and the cluster covariance matrices, C1, C2. Yeah, we, we, we need those. So there's cl uh, cluster mean vectors and covariance matrices. We need to evaluate this conditional probability function because this is the evaluation of the Gaussian distribution. And in the Gaussian distribution, so if I may write this out, what does this mean? Uh, this means one over square root of the determinant of two pi covariance matrix C1 times exp uh, exponential function of Xi minus M1 uh, transposed covariance matrix inverse and so on and so forth. So if you should know one probability distribution by heart, uh, my recommendation is uh, this Gaussian distribution. This is an expression which involves the, the mean vector and the covariance matrix. So we, if we know only the, the realization here, xi, this we know. Here we get a vector, a number, a particular number. But in order to evaluate the probability distribution, we also need to know the mean vector and the covariance matrix. And these are, param these are parameters of our Gaussian mixture models and nobody tells you what these are given the data. You have to estimate them. So what do we do? Well, we start with a random guess for those. Start with a random guess, as always. And then we can evaluate the, this post posterior probabilities or cluster assignments. And again, we turn the problem in, <laughs> in the other direction. Used, uh, using this new guesses for the cluster assignments, we compute new estimates for the cluster probabilities and for the mean vectors. Okay, this is the other update step in, in the soft clustering algorithm, which you, not sure if you had to implement it or it just was a demo in the notebook. So update, update these parameters. And what would, do we do with the new parameter guesses or the updated parameter estimates? We update the degrees of belonging or the posterior probabilities. Update YII, uh, YI2, YI1. Okay, what do we do then after two updates? Should we stop? Why not? Sorry? So we have to repeat it until convergence. Yeah, and uh, what, what do we mean by convergence? Well, we can check how, so in the course of the soft clustering algorithm, 
we produce more, more and more refined estimates of, of the parameters for the Gaussian mixture model. And this Gaussian mixture model provides us with a, a probability distribution of the data points. And this probability distribution, so this probability distribution looks like this. It's a, uh, so if I draw it here uh, schematically, only in one dimension, this is the uh, one data point, and this is drawn from a probability distribution, and this probability distribution is the sum of Gaussians, a, a mixture of Gaussians. Here we have one Gaussian with mean vector M1, here another Gaussian with mean vector M2, and we specify, Gaussian mixture model specifies a probability distribution for these uh, feature vectors, and this probability distribution depends on the parameters, of course. Uh, C1, C2, and the class of probabilities, P1, P2. And running this soft clustering algorithm provides us with estimates of these parameters, which we could, can then use to evaluate the probability that we observe precisely the data points that we observe. And if this probability is 10 to the power of minus 100, then this tells you that this estimates, these parameter estimates that you have here are crap, or you have not converged. So if this becomes somewhat near one, or the maximum, you can, you can work out what the potential maximum is. It's not one because it's a density. Uh, so if this is a reasonable number, 10 to the uh, power of uh, minus one, for example, and it doesn't change anymore, so you, you in particular, you, you monitor the change of this probability or evidence values. The evidence is the probability that given the model that you use, in this case a Gaussian mixture model, you actually observe the data points that you observe. It's kind of trivial, it sounds trivial, but that's what you can do to fit the model. So it's again nothing, soft clustering method is nothing but fitting a model, a Gaussian mixture model in this case, which is a probabilistic model, which depends on parameters like the mean vectors and the covariance matrices. And you, you try to fit the model by, by tuning these parameters in order to make the probability that you observe the data that you observe is high. Pretty intuitive, but that, that's it, what you do in uh, probabilistic machine learning in one form or the other. And in this case, what you do is to, you fit a Gaussian mixture model. And why do we use a Gaussian mixture model? because we represent clusters by Gaussian distributions. And using these Gaussian distributions allows us to find out uh, the degree of belonging as the posterior probability that the cluster assignment is uh, a particular, uh, corresponds to a particular cluster given the observed data. Yeah. What are your questions regarding soft clustering using Gaussian mixture models. I have tried to make the discussion more clear in the course book, so there will be a new version released by the beginning of next week, I hope. Uh, yeah. This is kind of the only point, this soft clustering, where I don't know any method that avoids a, a probabilistic model. And this, this comes out so, so naturally here uh, to use probabilistic models because this gives such a, a clear interpretation to degrees of belonging. What do you mean by degrees of belonging? Well, we mean here in this probabilistic modeling, it's a posterior probability. It's a well-defined concept, a probability. Yes. Yes, so the question was, what's the mechanism to, to update these parameters given the, given the degrees of belongings? And the basic idea is to do a maximum likelihood estimation. So you, you choose these parameters to make the probability that you have, that you kind of observe or get these degrees of belonging, maximum. And you can work this out, and what you get are rather intuitive update rules the, I write it here, so the Gaussian mixture model parameter updates are as follows. The cluster probabilities, 
So the, the probability that uh, one of that the data point is drawn from cluster one is just the sum of all the degree of, for all data points of the degrees of belonging to cluster one divided by all data points you have. Similar for the cluster probability two, you sum the degrees of belonging for all data points that they belong to cluster two and normalize by the number of data points. How do you get an, an estimate for the, the cluster mean? Well, you do uh, a sample mean. You, uh, you, you average all the data points you have. You normalize it. But you, you have to take into account that each data point only belongs to a certain degree to cluster one. So you have to weight this using the degrees of belonging. So here, degree of belonging to cluster one. And you normalize this not by the, by the overall data uh, sample size or number of data points, but by the effective number of data points in cluster one, which is uh, the sum of all degrees of belonging to cluster one over all data points. So this here is the effective, effective uh, cluster size of cluster one. And the same game for mean vector two, you normalize by the effective size of cluster two, and you take the, the sample mean or the weighted sample mean using the degrees of belonging to cluster two. So this here, make sure that if, if a data point belongs to cluster two only 50% or 0 0.5, so this would be 0 0.5, then this, this component in the sum for the, for the mean only has weight 0 0.5. Or if this degree of belonging is zero, you don't take into account this data point at all for the cluster because it doesn't belong at all to this cluster. Yeah, and similar rules you have for the, uh, for the covariance matrix estimates, which I don't repeat here. Or maybe there was one, maybe I will for cluster one. There was one question, quiz question regarding the invertibility of the, the cluster covariance matrix, matrix estimate. So we use the, the sample covariance matrix. This is called sample covariance matrix. Uh, times xi minus the cluster mean for cluster one. And we weight this again. We always weight each sample using the degrees of belonging. And this sum here, so I equal one to n, this sum here has, can have rank at most, the rank of this sum, so the rank of this covariance matrix, is upper bounded by n. Because you sum here n out, they are called outer product. So this is called an outer product. Outer product. So this is now hardcore linear algebra stuff, but it's good to, to have it heard at least. So this is an outer product of rank one. Rank one, and you sum n of these rank one matrices. So the, you can show using the fundamental laws of linear algebra that the rank of this whole estimate is at most n. And what's, what's the size of this matrix? What's the, the dimensions of this matrix? How many, how many rows and how many columns has this estimate of the covariance matrix? Sorry? No, so you, you compute here this, this uh, feature vectors with its transposed. How large is the feature vector? D. So this is D, a D times D matrix, and if this D would be larger, larger than the sample size, then this matrix here ha would have a rank smaller than its size, and this means it's non-invertible. And if it's non-invertible, by the way, this whole modeling breaks down because this uh, Gaussian distribution here is only defined for uh, invertible covariance matrices. So whenever you have the, the case that you have less data points than the length of your vectors is, uh, 
this whole thing doesn't work anymore. And you have to come up with something else. One idea is just to, to don't estimate, di directly estimate the covariance matrices, but to set it to a fixed covariance matrix, to say, well, the shape, the shape is always similar, it's more or less symmetric, so let's say we, we fix the covariance matrix of the cluster to an identity matrix times some factor sigma square. So this is a, a positive number. And we only learn this parameter here. Okay. What other questions do you have? Yes. Yes. Yeah, but all this works only in the case where you have two clusters. Yeah, you have n minus one degrees of freedom or k minus one. Yeah. Yes. So. So the question was why using a, a probabilistic model to come up with a soft clustering scheme, why not just use the distances to the, to the cluster means, yeah. which are unknown by the way, and then compare them? Yes, but how, how would you work it out in, in a precise, in a, in a rigorous way? You, you can compute the distances, but how do you compare the distances to the, to the cluster means? And how do you update then the cluster means based on these distance measurements? I don't know. So if anybody knows about a soft clustering algorithm or a motivation of this soft clustering algorithm, which does not refer to Gaussian mixture models, I'm happy to hear. Okay. So I suggest to have a break of 10 minutes and then we go into the finale grande of the course, which is about how to automatically learn good features. We know the cluster means and we have the points there. Yeah. And we can compare each point to the cluster means how far away mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the means they are. And what, what do you do then with the comparison? So I can say that uh, this is uh, like 70% belongs to here and then 50 persons here. So I have the balance how, how much how, it does yeah, okay. belong to each cluster and which is its closest. How, how do you translate the distances into this uh, percentage? Well, we have this cluster in this location, so yeah, you, we you can just uh, calculate the, the distance here, distance here, like Manhattan distance or something like that. Yeah. Okay. But, 
yeah, let's say you, you get the percentages. What do you do then next with the percentages? Because the cluster means you, you used in the first place, where did you get them from? So the this was just an estimate. Yeah, them. okay. And and it's just an estimate. Yeah. yeah, and how do you now update the, the cluster means based on the, on the, on the percentages? Well, I just thought uh, you could uh, run for uh, like k times and update the cluster means first and then look at the distances, yeah. how much each point belongs to each cluster means. But what does the probabilistic function do? That's better. The, the probabilistic function gives you an interpretation of what the algorithm is doing. In particular, it also provides you a criterion for when to stop the iteration. You, you have a probability distribution for the data points, so you can evaluate what is the probability that you see these data points, given the current cluster means and covariance matrices. Well, if, if, if you want to work this out, I'm, I'm happy to try to support this and maybe write a book about it. <laughs> I was just my wondering why, yeah. why no, it doesn't have to be so complicated. What well, if, 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 if you Google around what's, what's and you, the you check... In there? Yeah. How would you proceed? I mean, what you would come up with would maybe just be an uh, imitation of the of the update steps in the gaussian Nuxta model. How, how, how do you use yeah, the percentages like to update that, the cluster means? Well, you do exactly what you, you compute the cluster means weighted by these percentages. So in the end, uh, the algorithm would look, I guess, would look very similar to, to, to what, what comes out of a probabilistic modeling. And the advantage of a probabilistic modeling, it's, it's mathematically rigorous. It's, it's kind of a, a closed theory, a complete theory. Hmm. Yeah, I just thought it would be more simple to do it this way, but I'm not sure. Yeah, well, you try. It would be interesting to pursue it. I'm not sure if I can. <laughs> I, 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 I tried out, but I, and also when you Google also the, at the other universities, when they teach soft clustering, it's always with Gaussian Luxian models. But might, might be interesting, you see. Hey, yeah. quick question about inbounds da data sets. I yeah. read an article about it because I noticed that in the project material, yeah. it's obviously a little skewed. Yeah. So I tried to uh, train a deep learning model at first, and obviously it went horribly wrong because it only guessed the most accurate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. So would you say that are the, like, are they, I think they're called tree based algorithms, are they always better than? over or under assembly in those cases? Hard to say. <laughs> or is it case, case dependent? Case over, well, over. You have to try to. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, okay, someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Yeah. By the way, do you happen to have any other courses on the subject? Or well, is, so is, is this the only one you, you're teaching? Um, uh, so this might be the la last round I do this course. Next okay. year I might set up a new course which is more focused on, on this optimization aspects okay. like gradient descent, stochastic yeah, gradient yeah. descent and how to implement the algorithms. Okay. Would you have any suggestions what courses to take next, if, if I'm interested in, in all this? Yeah, I will send out an email then to, to oh, all students okay. from my courses, oh, yeah, with pointers. Yeah, yeah. thanks. With a question? Yeah. Yeah. Openings? Yes. For like projects? Projects, yes, always. Okay. Just um, drop me an email. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll find it out. Yeah. I, I, maybe I can stop it.
So I get one question via Panopto, <clears throat> via our webcast, from a student which asked what, what is the distribution then of the data points themselves. So there's an our model, there's a random, a random vector within our Gaussian mixture model. What is the distribution? I tried to sketch it here schematically for a, a one-dimensional or a scalar <clears throat> feature vector or scalar feature but uh, just written out the probability distribution for a data point given the current estimates for the parameters, which are the mean vectors, the covariance matrices, and the cluster probabilities. So this here is uh, a sum of two Gaussian distributions. So here we have the first, M1, and cluster covariance matrix C1 weighted by the cluster probability of the individual clusters, and here the same Gaussian distribution with mean and covariance matrix for cluster two. So that's, and that's why it's called a, a Gaussian mixture model. It's an additive mixture or a sum of Gaussian distributions. Each Gaussian distribution corresponds to one cluster. So for one, cl one cluster is one individual Gaussian distribution, which is parameterized or characterized by a mean vector and a covariance matrix. Any other questions regarding Gaussian mixture models or soft clustering? Okay, so let's move on to the final topic of our course, which is about feature learning. So let's assume we have a data point, like a drawing of an apple. So this is a data point. Uh, how can we represent the data point in digital form? Well, we could stack the, if it's a, a bitmap, we could stack the pixel, the pixel intensities or colors into a vector Z. So here we look at the first pixel, we stack this here, this is C1. And here we have some pixel in between. This is C100 up to C B pixels. So I now use capital B to denote the length of the, of the vector. What is a typical value of capital D here for, for images, hand-drawn, images of hand-drawn apples? Sorry? Well, how, how many pixels would you use for such an image, for the resolution for such an image? 128 by 128. So this vector would be long d equal 128 to the power of two. And this is too large. So using Python, the Python notebook, we want smaller vectors. So we want to represent this by a smaller vector x. What did we use as vector so far for images when we had to process images? The greenness and the redness of the image, yep. But let's now try to come up with a method that automates the process. So we want to find a mapping, let's call it phi, which takes the large feature vector and returns, a, uh, which takes the, the, the large data point or vector which represents the data point. So this is in RD. And this should be a small feature vector, R small d. And d should be way smaller than capital D. 
we came up with two features. So for, for this classification round, we managed to have feature vectors of size d equal 2. But we, we hand engineered the features. So we, we did some thinking and then came up with the idea of maybe it's a good idea to detect grass by using the greenness because grass is green typically. So this is a, we use expert domain knowledge to, f to engineer the features, to select the features uh, out of the raw data. The raw data is the JPEG file and the feature is the greenness. But there are methods that can automate this process and these modern deep learning methods are pretty good in automatically learning relevant features. So the deep learning methods uh, learn or find this map automatically. Find good map. And we will now focus on a subclass of feature learning methods which uses a linear map. So we, we say we want to construct a feature vector by applying a linear map which is represented by a matrix which we call the compression matrix. To the original data point. So this compression matrix has rows, uh, D rows and capital D columns. And this is, a, we call it a fat matrix. It has way less rows than it has columns. And the question is then how to choose the compression matrix. But first, before we discuss how to choose it, I want to show you that, it, that this can work, really work. And I want to show it with a, a simple image. Guess what? Of an apple. So I, I found some image of an apple. I read it in, in MATLAB. Uh, I created a grayscale version of the image. And this full-blown image, it's 200, around 220 pixels times 220 pixels. So this gives a dimension of more than 50,000. And somewhere here in the, in the code here, uh, we have we have this data point here. It's stored as a uh, under name i. And then what I do, I apply a linear transform, uh, a matrix W, which has, for example, d equal nine rows. So I, I construct a feature vector x of length nine. And then I, I reconstruct, I try to reconstruct the image based on this feature vector. And you see it's hardly, uh, it cannot, we have difficulty to find out that it's an apple. So d equal 9 is, is too little. We, we lost too much information. Uh, d equal 100, um, would you say that this is an apple? Good question? So, good question. Uh, so how did I choose this, weight, uh, this uh, matrix W, this compression matrix? Well, I was trained in, in signal processing. Signal processing also involves image processing, and there I learned some tw 10 to 15 years ago that a good way to, to transform the image or to compress it is to use uh, uh, something like a Fourier transform. So I did a, a Fourier transform, a, a two-dimensional Fourier transform, and kept only the largest uh, values. OK. So d equal 9, d equal 100, yeah, but we have one more, d equal 400. And for d equal 400, so using 400 features, it's pretty clear that it's an apple. Uh, so we somehow kept a lot of relevant information from the original data point by using 400 features, by using a feature vector of length 400 compared to the length of the original data point as a vector 50,000. So we saved, we, we achieved around the compression rate of, so we compressed it to 1%, less than 1% of the original length without uh, losing too much information. No. Any question? And, well, this is also underlying, this principle is also underlying uh, in some more advanced or sophisticated implementation in MP3, in MPEG, in uh, video compression. 
So they use transform coding. They find a good matrix W, which uh, produces a small set of relevant features. Okay, so this is a, a, an example I, I worked out in five or 10 minutes in order to convince you that it is possible. But now the question is, how do we find this matrix W without uh, studying signal processing at the university and hearing about discrete cosine transform or Fourier transform, which is a, a class of good choices if you know that the signals or data you have are, are audio signals or images, but how to choose it automatically for any data set that you, that you encounter in your studies or in your work. So how, how should we choose W? Or put it another way, given a particular web, uh, matrix W, how to tell how good is a particular matrix W. We had a similar, a similar problem in, right in the beginning of this course when we wanted to find a good uh, map from features to a label. So we wanted to find a good predictor map. How did we evaluate the quality of a particular predictor map? And here, this W again represents a map, a map from data point to feature vector now. How can we evaluate the quality of, of such a map or a, a matrix W? A loss function. We need a loss function. Okay? So what, what do we use here as loss function? Let's say we apply W to a data point. Let's say we have a, some data points. So we have a bunch of data points, C1 up to C capital N. Again, we have a data set. So one ingredient, again, data. However, this data set is not labeled. It's just a bunch of vectors. No labels here, just, so to say, raw feature vectors. So these are all vectors in RD. We apply this particular W to all these data points or feature vectors to get new feature vectors x1 equals W C1. Xn equals W C N. Okay, so we get feature vectors. How can we now evaluate the quality? How good are these? How good are these new feature vectors? Well, we could do it like uh, I did now. We, we could try to, to, to draw these new feature vectors or reconstruct it, make an image, and look if the original image was an apple, is the new reconstructed image also similar to an apple. So, and then we can say we give this W 10 points or five points. Yeah, but, okay, but this would be very costly. Uh, it needs a lot of human labor. You can do it maybe using Amazon Mechanical Turk, and to some extent it's done like this. However, we can do something else. We can say, well, we could use as a loss function the, the reconstruction quality. So we can try to come up with a reconstructed version of C1 using some reconstruction mapping, R. So we multiply this compressed feature vector using some other matrix, which by the way now has to be Tall. It has to be D times capital D. And we do it with all the new feature vectors, R, C, N. Okay, and then we can say the quality or the loss or the risk involved in using a particular weight vector and reconstruction matrix, this is another uh, parameter here in this process, is just the sum of squared norm differences between the true original data point and the reconstructed data point. Does that make sense? Yes? Yes, the, the number of original raw features. Capital D is large. The smaller D is the number of, of new features that we then use further on. So this feature learning is used as a pre-processing such that we get out uh, D 
these feature vectors x1 till xn and these feature vectors then you use to, for example, do the stuff we did in the round one, two, three, regression or classification. So this is a reconstruction error. Does that make sense? To, to measure the quality of a particular ma matrix W by measuring how well can we reconstruct the original data points using these feature vectors, these compressed feature vectors, and some reconstruction uh, operator R. Well, we need to specify what the reconstruction operator is, but uh, typically we, we choose the reconstruction operator which minimizes this. And this then gives uh, a loss function which depends only on W. And what do we do? We choose W in order to to minimize the loss function. So again, it's an optimization problem. So the optimal, uh, optimal compression matrix is the matrix which achieves the minimum reconstruction error. Arc min over all compression matrices of dimension D times capital D, FW, and if I insert what we have here, this is arc min W min R over all reconstruction matrices, uh, epsilon W R. And then we can insert the expression here for the error. This is arg min, min W R, uh, one over N, sum of all the reconstruction errors for each data point individually minus set hat, these are the reconstruction errors, and then this is the same as one over n, and then we insert how we define the reconstruction, it's the reconstruction matrix times the feature vector, so this is set i minus reconstruction matrix times uh, compression matrix times ci, and this is an optimization problem which depends on the observed data. So the data points is that what we have to our disposal. So this original raw feature vectors we have and we can use to solve this problem in order to get a good compression matrix which we then apply to new data. So how do we solve this optimization problem? It turns out that this optimization problems, the solution of this, or the optimal weight vector, is closely related to the sample covariance matrix of this original feature vector. So let's define the sample covariance matrix uh, C like this. Sum over I to N. CI times CI transposed. And this is nothing but, you can, we can write this in a slightly different form as one over N times data matrix or feature matrix, raw feature matrix, C times, uh, or C transposed times C. And this is the raw feature matrix. So here in the in the rows we have the original the raw feature vectors transposed. So this is a matrix of size n times d, which makes this a matrix of size d times d. What do we know about this matrix? Well, it's positive semi-definite. C is a positive semi-definite matrix. And linear algebra tells us that we can compute we each positive set or each positive semi-definite matrix possesses a very a beautiful eigenvalue decomposition. Eigenvalue decomposition. So we can write C as it is a positive semi-definite matrix as a product of three matrices. 
The first one contains the eigenvectors of this matrix. So this contains the eigenvectors of C. Then a diagonal matrix, which contains the eigenvalues of the matrix C. So this is lambda 1 up to lambda d. And these are non-negative, so they're real valued, non-negative, and we order them uh, decreasingly. So lambda 1 is larger or equal than lambda 2, and so on and so forth, till lambda d, and this is larger or equal than 0. Yeah, and here we have the third factor is the transposed of the first factor. So it's again a matrix which contains the eigenvectors of C, but now in its rows, so it's transposed. Okay. This is the eigenvalue, this is how the eigenvalue decomposition of a positive semi-definite matrix looks like. So if you have to learn something in more detail within linear algebra, have a look at the properties of positive semi-definite matrices, in particular uh, the eigenvalue decomposition of positive semi-definite matrices. This is really the, uh, one of the, the bread and butter tools we use in, in particular in unsupervised machine learning. And here, for, we use it for finding the optimal, the optimal compression matrix that, because it turns out that the optimal compression matrix is nothing but the first D eigenvectors of this co uh, covariance matrix. So we can read off the, op the, the color or the rows of this compression matrix, of the optimal compression matrix, from this first D, uh, lowercase d, eigenvectors of this covariance matrix. So this is a matrix in D times D. Any questions up to here? Or what are your questions up to here? Of the feature vector, yeah? Of the new feature. Size of xi. And this here is the size or length of the original raw features. Okay. And the eigenvalue decomposition actually tells us more. It also tells us the minimum or the optimal reconstruction error. So we can also read out the minimum over all compression matrices and all reconstruction matrices of this reconstruction error, which is simply the sum of all eigenvalues that we discard. So we start at D plus one till capital D, and we sum the the eigenvalues of the sample covariance matrix C. Okay. So this is the reconstruction error achieved by the optimal compression matrix. Yeah. And for historic reasons, the, the new features, so we then apply this optimal compression matrix to the original, the raw feature vectors, and the entries of this, of this new feature vector are called principal components. And principal components analysis refers to the computation or determination of this optimal compression matrix and the associated compression error. So principal component analysis from a computational perspective, from a computational perspective, is essentially computing the eigenvalue decomposition of this uh, covariance matrix, of this sample covariance matrix. So that's, that's how you find automatically this transformation into lower dimensional feature vectors. Yes? Yes, you, you have a bunch of these data points, of these raw feature vectors, and you use them to compute this covariance matrix. Okay. 
all, all the data points you have. Of course, it's, it's a question also of the complexity. Uh, you have to compute this sum here. So for this sum, you have to multiply vectors, uh, outer, take outer products of vectors and sum over all data points. And if you want to do a principal component analysis of ImageNet, for example, which contains billions of images, then this might be challenging this sum, and then you take a subset of data points. So computationally, principal component analysis, or feature learning, amounts to computing an eigenvalue decomposition. How difficult is it to compute an eigenvalue decomposition? Or does anybody of you have a, a method to compute the eigenvalue decomposition? And don't tell me now function names of MATLAB or Python. How would you compute the, the, eigen, the eigenvectors of a, of a given positive semi-definite matrix? Yeah, you, you can go by uh, solving the characteristic equation. So you turn it into the problem of finding roots of a polynomial. You, Sometimes it's also done the other way. If you want to solve, uh, if you want to find the roots of a polynomial, construct a, a matrix such that the characteristic polynomial is this polynomial, and then compute the eigenvalues. So, quite often it's it's uh, more or more convenient to go directly for the for the eigenvectors uh, using linear algebra techniques before turning it into a problem of solving uh, equations or polynomials. So I want to just mention one, and this, so computing, if efficient computing of the eigenvalue decomposition of large matrices is part of bleeding edge research. So this is really the, the forefront of research. Now I just stumbled across a paper which came out a few months ago, which just came up with, uh, with, a, character, uh, with a theoretic analysis of what is the fundamental limit, how much computation do we need to compute such eigenvalue decompositions. Uh, in, in distributed settings, so where the data is stored uh, in different data center, centers all over the world. So this is really uh, a hard problem and a lot of research goes into developing methods to do this eigenvalue decomposition fast for large, large data sets. But one very simple method to compute the first eigenvector, so the eigenvector U1, which corresponds to the largest uh, eigenvalue, which gives kind of the first principal components, is the, the power iteration method. How many of you have heard about power iterations? And this goes as follows. So the goal is to goal find eigenvector u1 of the sample of the sample covariance matrix C corresponding to largest eigenvalue. to the largest eigenvalue. And it goes as follows. You start with an, a random guess, start with random guess, a random vector, randomly chosen vector. Let's call it V or U. Let's call it U. And you apply, so this is U0, U hat zero. And then you construct a new guess for the largest eigenvector, or for the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue by just applying the covariance matrix. And you normalize. So you divide by the norm of this new vector. And you repeat this again. So you get the kth estimate for this eigenvector by applying the previous estimate, k minus one, and dividing by the norm of this new estimate. You had k minus one. And you repeat this for 1,000 iterations. And what you get, this u hat for large enough k gets an approximation for the first eigenvector. This is called power iteration. And it amounts to just repeatedly applying the covariance matrix. You apply the covariance matrix, get a new vector, you normalize it to norm one, apply again the covariance matrix. Normalize to one, apply again the covariance matrix. 
And it turns out that somehow magically, this sequence of, of vectors that you get from this power iteration converges to the eigenvector of the covariance matrix C, which corresponds to the largest eigenvalue. You don't need to use any Gauss elimination. You don't need to solve any characteristic polynomials. Just repeatedly apply the covariance matrix. OK. So this brings me to the end of the actual content of the course. We will have next week starting the, the last exercise round on the principal component analysis, which essentially amounts to implementing this eigenvalue decomposition yourself for some data set. And maybe we'll have a, a, que a, a question on, on these power iterations. Yeah, and then you sh might be busy already also with the data analysis project. I want to highlight that we don't have, yes, one question. So the question was, how, how does this approach uh, relate to, to Fourier transform of sounds or pictures? Uh, it turns out that the, the eigenvalues, the eigenvectors of data sets, which are natural sounds, resemble, for some reason, uh, Fourier, uh, the Fourier transform. It's some, somehow in the structure of the data. It might also be related to our processing system. Because our processing system uh, uh, in the brain is matched to, to Fourier analysis. OK. Any other questions? Yes? So the question was, is the eigenvalue decomposition the same as singular value decomposition? Uh, the eigenvalue de decomposition is a special case of singular value decomposition for uh, positive semi-definite matrices. So singular value decomposition applies to any matrix. Uh, when it's a positive semi-definite matrix, it reduces to an eigenvalue decomposition. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to point out we have no minimum point requirement for the data analysis project. So you essentially are not required to do it. However, if you, if you look at our grading policy, you will find out that in order to get grades better than two, uh, you have to perform well in the data analysis project. Any other questions regarding the course? Okay, then, thanks a lot, and good luck with the final round and the data analysis project.